happy Sabbath, everyone. God is good. We serve a mighty God, indeed. What do you say? All right. Now, I want to say a very special welcome to each and every one this morning. Welcome to Sabbath School Lesson Hour. And we want to continue what we've started. Last week, we're going to be looking at part two of teaching the disciples. Part two, teaching the disciples. I also crave your participation as we go into this week's lesson review. Before we continue, let us seek the Lord, Lord's guidance. Father in heaven, we pray that you will be with us. Forgive us of our sins. Be the great teacher among us. Open our hearts. Open our eyes so that we will receive and that we will see clearly your truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, our memory text comes to us from where? From the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses, uh, verse 45. Yes, no, for even the Son of Man did not come to what? To be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, if you notice today's ministers, so to speak, they like to be served. But your Christ is telling us that he came not to be served, but to serve. And so you notice that in, 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 in Christendom, a lot of the pastors these, day, these days, they, they, they like the, the, the service that they receive rather than the service that they should be given. And so sometimes when you see um, Elder Tooth marching up, he will walk with his bodyguards, so to speak, or his entourage that he calls his armor bearers. Do you notice that sometimes in some Christendom? You know what I'm talking about. But anyway, that's beside the point. Now, Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to, but to serve. And so, this lesson is all about discipleship. It's all about service, right? It's about what we can do for Christ. In other words, there's a popular statement in, 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 in well, I think went dead now. Well, let me switch to my phone. In, um, in the political world, world, they will tell you, it is not what the country can do for you, but it is what you can do for the country. That's in politics. And so in Christendom, it is not what the church can do for you, but what you can do for the church when it comes on to ministry. And this is where many of us fail at times because a lot of us don't like to serve, but we like to be served. But the church is not doing anything for me, so I'm not going back down there. It's not about that. It's about what we can do. It's a ministry. Amen? And so, Mark 10 and verse 45 tells us that Jesus Christ came to give his life a ransom for how much? Hmm? For all. All right. I'm switching to my phone here because my um, tablet here is giving a little trouble. All right. All right. Now, let's move on. Now, this, this, this week covers a Mark 10. Now, last week we looked at a blind man, and this week we also look at another blind man, because that story to this story actually completes what we have been talking about in terms of who Jesus is, and Jesus is switching gears to actually where he's going. And so right now we are focusing on where Christ is going, and it, it is to the cross. And so Mark 10 covers that, right? Now, about half of the chapter deals with the disciples themselves and the rest of the issue important to the disciples, but told through the lens of others to interact with Jesus. And so the Pharisees, they came to argue with him over the subject of what? Divorce. And a few weeks ago, a few days, Sabbaths ago, pastor was dealing with the subject of this. We're going to talk some more about that. All right? And so parents brought also their children to Jesus. A rich man came and asked him about eternal life. And a blind man came asking to receive his sight. And so we'll be focusing on all of these stories as we move along, all right? But this chapter of Mark carries important teachings about what it means to follow Jesus. And so we're going to also be digging about that, what it means to follow Jesus. Following Jesus, Jesus said, if any man will follow me, let him do what? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow him. So Jesus, particularly as it relates to living in, in the era now, Marriage, children, and how to relate to riches, and the reward and cost of following him. So, topping it off is the healing of the second blind man, and his name is what? What's the name of the second blind man? Bartimaeus. All right, let's move on. Let's jump over to Sunday's lesson. Let's look at God's plan for marriage. What is God's plan for marriage? 
Here in this lesson, we, 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 we see where the Pharisees, they came with a trap to trap Jesus, right? And what was their trap? They asked him about what? Divorce. That's what they asked Jesus. Now, let's look at how Jesus dealt with this situation. Now, in Genesis 1 and verse 27, the Bible tells us, So God created man what? In his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female created him. And in Genesis 2 and verse 24, the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and join to his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. So if you look carefully in this passage, the Pharisees ask him if it's lawful for a man to divorce his wife. Now, a few days ago, Pastor was dealing with this. Pastor mentioned two terms. And Pastor, I'm going to test the church now. Right? Now, I'm not going to do it like what Ella Cohen, Pastor Cohen said he was going to do. But I'm going to see if they were, they were following you in the Bible class. What are the two terms that Pastor mentioned that came up in this week's lesson as we talk about divorce? What, what, what are the two terms? Pastor, you're going to have to get a belt now, Pastor. <laughs> what are the two terms? Pastor taught us these two terms. And we were looking at these two terms. What are they? It is Shammai, right? And what is the other one? Elel. Do you see those words in the lesson? All right. So we're going to look at this now. According to um, Deuteronomy 24, the Bible tells us that according to Moses' law, it said if a man wants to divorce his wife, what should he do? He should write a what? A bill of divorce and do what? And put it to her, in her hand. And this, according to that law, was to protect the woman. But what was happening now in these uh, um, time is that these men, the supposed leaders of the church, they were practicing mostly the other one, which is Hillel, right? So Shammai was arguably more restrictive only for childlessness, material neglect, emotional ne neglect, or marital unfaithfulness, whereas Hillel was more like for trivial matters. And pastor explained all these things and lesson did that too. So with the Hillel type of situation, if I get up this morning and Sister Karen made the food a little bit too salt, I said, man, I don't bother want her again. I just give her a bill of divorce and just get rid of her, just like that. Right? Or if when I put my shoes down, you know, some of you men, you come off, you just slip off your shoes, and a woman is walking behind you all the time, taking up and cleaning up the place, but she gets tired this time and didn't do it, and then you start to complain, woman, why didn't you clean up the place? Sorry. Then, for that reason, you would do what? Write her a bill of divorce, man. Or you take off a jacket and put it on, she didn't take it off. You get upset about that. Trivial matters. Right? So this was the situation. And so they came to Jesus now, asking him the question, what, how, how you would deal with this? So Christ brought them back to where? Genesis. That in the beginning, God made man and woman, male and female. And in Genesis 2.24, he says, they shall cleave together and become what? So what is your perception of this now? What is God, God basically saying about divorce here? Our marriage, so to speak. In God's eyes, what he's trying to tell him is that in the beginning, it is God's intention that a man and a woman should be together. Right? You should not be practicing this, what they were doing. And so Jesus um, actually turned away from their question, so to speak, and showed them, brought them back to the book of Genesis. And I like this. I remember when we were studying about the book of Acts, with Paul, and, on, and, 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 and when Paul went up to uh, Marzil and he saw all the, 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 the idols that they were worshipping, and they were worshipping the unknown God, you remember? What did Paul do? He brought them back to where? To Genesis. And he taught them about the true God of the universe. And so even you, even us in our discourse, our witnessing program, whenever we come across any question, go back to where? The beginning. Because when we go back to the beginning, we can't go wrong. Amen? Point people back to the beginning. And that's what Jesus did here in this. And so, Jesus is saying that when it comes down to these two terms, um, or basically marriage, Hebrews 13 verse 4 says what? Marriage is what? Honorable. And the bed? Come on, Bridget, talk to me. Don't you know the scripture? Talk, talk, talk to me. Marriage is what? It's an honorable thing. Marriage is not a bad thing. And so basically what is coming out from this lesson, if you look deeply into it, is that um, the devil is attacking an institution that God created from the beginning. Do you, do you see that? 
the great controversy. That's what is popping up um, in, in this question here um, about marriage. It's a part of the great controversy. Satan's effort is to destroy the family. What is God's ideal for the family? A man and a woman leave his mother and father and do what? Cleave together and become what? One flesh. That's a family. And God's ideal in Genesis 1 verse 27 says a family consists of what? A man and a woman. And they shall reproduce what? Children. Not a man and a man, nor a woman and a woman. Right? But a man and a man. And sadly to say that in today's society, the world is practicing the ill type of divorce, so to speak. Right? Just this week I was reading on the news. Some of you may have seen it. Jennifer Lopez, Ben Affleck, filing for divorce. Right? They were recently married a few, few years now. Right? And even in Hollywood, when you look at the stars, they get married today, millions of dollars spent on the wedding, and a few days down the road, they divorce. Right? Don't you see that happening in Hollywood? But guess what? Hollywood is creeping into the church too. And we find that in the church, virgin hearts are so unforgiving, they don't want to give their spouse if something goes wrong in the relationship. And what do you do? You jump out of and keep going over. Are, are you with me? And so it seems as if today, according to statistics, that the divorce rate in the church is increasing more than that of the world. And this is not God's plan for the family. This is not God's plan for the church. Right? And so this is what was happening, that even most of these leaders, they were practicing the Hillel type of situation. And that is why they came to Jesus trying to trap him. All right, so let's move on. So God's ideal for, the, for marriage is that he wants marriage to work. And so even in the case of the Shammai, that talk, even in the case of unfaithfulness, the Bible says it's up on the what? The hardness of your heart. Right? So practice forgiveness even in marriage. It is not God's plan that infidelity should creep in, but if it does, God is saying you must be able to forgive. Practice forgiveness in your heart. Make a marriage work. I know of someone who said to me some time ago that if she knew what she knows now, then she would not have divorced her husband. Because when she divorced her, this is not an Adventist, uh, some, a friend of mine. What, when she divorced her husband, Sister Mackin, it was over some trivial matters. And the day she divorced, which is like a bit, maybe more than <clears throat> 15 years now, she's still single. She wants to get married again. She can't find nobody. Still single. And it's a nice, so to speak, a beautiful woman, but still single. But she's now complaining that to herself that she's sorry she did it. Because she realized that the, on the grounds on which she did it was, it was trivial. The situation could have been talked over. It could have been worked out. And so if there's anyone inside you who's having issues with your marriage, we have Dr. Wilson inside you. Amen? He's a counselor. Come and talk to him. Right? He's a confidant. And even online, if you're having problems in your relationship, come and talk to a pastor. He's more than willing to, to help you. More than, and more than willing to help you to, 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 to bring the family structure back together again. Amen? He's a God-fearing man. Amen? Amen? You seem like the pastor, they seem like they don't agree with me. Alright? But it's, it's for a fact. God wants the relationship to work. All right, we move on. So this is a part of um, discipleship. Now, Monday, talk about Jesus and the children. What happened here? Here was Jesus. In Mark 10, verse 13 to 16, uh, some children were being, back in those days, children were seen as insignificant, right? They did not regard children, so to speak. And so the the, the mothers back then, the lesson brings out clearly that even sometimes in, in that culture, the male child was more accepted, so to speak. Sometimes when a woman gives birth to a daughter, they would leave the daughter, the little baby, to die out in the elements, so to speak. And we see cases like that today where people throw their babies in dumpster. They don't want them. Such case was also practiced back then. If it's, especially if it was a girl child, they don't want. Because the, 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 the male dominant society back then demands that they want more boys. I remember in, in, in Egypt, when, when the command was given to kill all the, the, the male child, that's, that's, that's because they know that the male child was significant. Because you remember the woman who lost her son, the woman who was on the, on the way to bury her son, and, and, and Jesus stopped the funeral procession and healed and, healed and raised the boy from, 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 from the dead. You remember, you remember that story? Because what happened is that that was her livelihood, so to speak, right? The man in the house was seen as a figure to take care and to provide for the family. And so in this 
time, so to speak. Children were not so much unless they were boys or grown up as male or, you know, female were, 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 were looked down on. And that is why you notice that even the feet of the 5,000, who did they count? Just the men. That's what is culture back then. They count the men. They didn't count the women, nor the children. But here is the children now. They, brought, they were coming to Jesus. And who rebuked them? The disciples. They rebuked them. And we practice that sometimes in our society where we say, when I was growing up, I would hear this. Children must be what? Seen, but not. So we, we have some of that even with us today too, right? We don't give the children the opportunity to express themselves. And so we have some of that within us too. And so they brought them and Jesus rebuked them. And we are told from the pen of inspiration that um, when the children came to Jesus, Jesus sat them down on his, lap, on his lap. One of them even fell asleep on his bosom. That's what Ellen White said. One of the child fell asleep in his bosom. And that was so nice. And the children, when they listened to Jesus, they, they felt comfortable. We're told from the Bible also that in the New Jerusalem, children be what? Playing in the streets of the New Jerusalem. Amen? And so children are important, right? And that's why we, we, we are told that the Bible says in, in, in Proverbs 22, I think verse 6, train up a what? A child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he what? He will not depart from it. Fathers, uh, this is New Testament now. Fathers, provoke not your children unto what? Unto wrath. Right? We must not. And Timothy again said, let no man despise their what? Their youth. And so children are important. And so where we have our children among us, we must not rebuke them or turn them away from Christ, but we must bring them to Jesus. Do you know what the Roman Catholic says about children? Give me a child, and I will make him a Catholic for life. That's what they say. Right? Give me a child, and I will do what? Make them a Catholic for life. All right. And so it is important that we follow Jesus' method where we train our children to go in the admonition of the Lord. All right, let me move on. The best investment. What is the best investment you could make? Is it CDs? Is it your 401k? Hmm? Is it your Scotia Mint you have in Jamaica? What is it? What is the best investment? Let's look at this. Now, the Bible tells us in Mark 10 and verse 17 to 31, we have the story, a very interesting story, about the young rich ruler, right? And we're also going to look at the cost of discipleship in this story. Now, this man approached Jesus. I heard the first part quickly. And he said to Jesus, Good master, what must I do to be what? To be saved. And Jesus said to him, What did Jesus say to him? Hmm? Yeah, but after Jesus asked him, Why call this me do? What did he say to Jesus? What did Jesus say to him? Hmm? Go and keep the what? The commandments. Jesus turned him to what? The commandments. Go and keep the commandments. What was his response? All these have I kept from when? From my youth up. What do, what do I lack? All right? What do I lack? All these have kept from my youth up. And then Jesus turned to him again and said, all right, very good. Now, go and sell all that you have and share with the poor. Go and sell all you have and go down to Broward Boulevard and give some of what you have to those homeless people. Go and sell all that you have and give to your neighbors, even down the street here. And what did he do? What was his response? The Bible says he went away sorrowfully. Now, the second commandment, he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. But yet still, the second commandment that which talks about idolatry, he was missing on that point. All right? Right? When Jesus said, thou shalt not have no other gods before me. All right? He, 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 this was his idol. Riches was his idol. Right? And so we look at the cost of following Jesus. Sometimes we have to give up everything. Christ was not really wanting him to sell everything per se and, and become a poor man. That's not what Christ was saying. Christ was just testing the integrity of his heart. Right? Jesus says, if any man would follow me, let him do what? Deny himself. Take up his what? Cross and follow me. If Christ should ask you that question today, what would be your response? Brother Henry, you wanted, you wanted to say, okay. Uh, what would be your response if Christ would say that to you? No, Jesus also made mention in comparison to a camel's eye and that of riches. And when Christ said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. No, we are told that the camel's eye was like what? It was not so much, I mean, a needle. A needle, needle's eye was not so much a needle that you saw with. But they used to have something back in those days that camel used to go through. And it was very difficult for them to go through. 
But Jesus was saying it was easier for the camel to go through that little trap door, so to speak, than for a rich man, because riches sometimes will hinder us from serving God. But not, not that anything is wrong with riches, but we must not set our heart upon it. Let me move on. Can you drink of this cup? Now, in Mark 10 and verse 32 to 45, these two disciples, what are their names? James and, right? So they came, to, they came to Jesus, and they asked Jesus a question. What did they ask Jesus? They said to Jesus, listen me, man, we want you to put us in position when you, in, in your kingdom. All right? No, the lesson tells us that um, these, uh, these, according to the prophecy, yes, coming, wrapping up soon, according to the prophecy, they were expecting a deliverer, a king to come to Israel to deliver them. Right? And so they were expecting Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom. And they were seeking, so, so to speak, a, a position in the kingdom. And so they said to Jesus, we want to put us on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side. But Jesus said to them, what did Jesus say to them? Can you drink of this cup? What was the cup that Christ was talking about? The cup of his what? Suffering. And Jesus said, if you can drink of this cup and also my baptism, then you can have a, a place. But it is not for me to tell you that it's for my father to decide for you a, a place in the kingdom. Amen? And so, talking about the cost of discipleship and talking about suffering. So Jesus was saying to them, they have to be baptized into his baptism and drink of his, the cup of his suffering. And we're told that James was one of the first to be, um, cru um, to be martyred while John was banished on the Isle of Patmos, who was the last one to, to die. Quickly, let me just wrap up on this point, Superintendent. What do you want me to do? So we move quickly to Mark 10 and verse 46 to 52. And we're going to wrap up on this uh, as, as we talk about blind Bartimaeus. He heard a lot of noise. Remember, he was blind, he couldn't see. But the lesson says that he heard a lot of noise, foot treading. And he said, what, is, what does this noise mean? Or mean? And they told him that Jesus was passing by. And when he heard that, he, he cried out with a loud voice, said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he cried louder and louder and louder. And he cried out. And the people tried to do what? Silence him. Sometimes when you come to church and you try to give out a praise, there are other members of the church who try to silence your praise. But don't let them silence your praise because they don't know what God has done for you. And when you come into this place, you want to shout hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lift up your hands and praise the Lord. Amen? Don't let nobody hold on your praise. And so they tried to shut him down. But he cried the more and said, Jesus, have mercy upon me. You see, the story behind is that blind Barty must have heard about Jesus. You have never seen him because he cannot see. But he heard about Jesus, Ella Mackin. And so when he heard that Jesus was passing by, he said, thou son of David, he was referring to the prophecy. And we have the text here in Michael 5 and verse 2 and, and Jeremiah 23 and verse 5 and 6. You look at those texts that talks about a prophet who would come or a deliverer would come for Israel. He knew of the prophecies. He heard, the, he heard of the prophecies. And so that was in the back of his mind. So when he heard that Jesus was passing by, he referred to him as the son of David, fulfilling a part of the prophecy. All right? Have mercy upon me. What did Jesus do? Jesus stopped and attended to him. He said, bring him to me. Now, when he was coming to Jesus, he did something. What did he do? He took off his cloak. In the story, it says that the cloak was his security. Because blind people are seen as the lowest of society. Because they cannot work, they cannot do anything to contribute to the, to, the, to the country. So they were seen as beggars. He put off what was his source of security. And in faith, he came to Jesus. Christ asked him the question, what do you want me to do for you? His response was, that I may what? Receive my sight. Now, from part one to part two, as I close, Christ healed the first blind man. He touched him twice, did it twice. He said to him, what can you see? He said, I see men like trees walking. Christ touched him again, and now he, see, he could see clearly. Now, this blind man, Christ said that because of your faith, it will be done to you, and he received his sight, and he saw clearly. So wrapping up on this story, yeah, the story, the, the lesson brings out the point that um, this story is the close of the discipleship set section in Mark, serving as a bookend with the other story of the eating of the blind man, right? And this story illustrates how discipleship is about seeing the world with new eyes, sometimes not clearly at first, but always following Jesus as he leaves. Ellen White says that with blind Bartimaeus, many of those who were running after Jesus, they could see, but they, they have no desire for him. Blind Bartimaeus could not see, but he had a desire. Many of us are coming to church. We can see, but we have no desire for Jesus. Only those who really earnestly want to see Christ will reach out after him. 
Are you like blind Martinus this morning? So Christ, in teaching, uh, in healing the first blind man, did it twice. He was teaching his disciples of where he was going to the cross. They could not see clearly. Because if they could have seen clearly, they, they wouldn't be talking about wanting to be placed in position, one on the right and one on the left. They could not see clearly Christ's mission. But with this story now, they can see. So Christ is saying now, in discipleship, we must give up everything. And though we may not be able to see clearly now, but if we but trust him like blind Bartimaeus, in the end, we will see clearly. Amen? Today, I ask the question as I close. If Christ were to ask you, what do you want him to do for you? What would be your response? I asked my wife this morning, Pastor, you want to hear a response? I'm not telling you. <laughs> Amen. All right, let me tell you just a little part. She said, Brother Henry, that God will grant her family to be together again. Isn't that lovely? Yes, and she said some, and I want her to be in the kingdom. But think about this question. If Christ were to ask you this morning, what do you want him to do for you? What would be your response? And I say to you now, ask Christ that question this morning. The thief on the cross, Christ made eye contact with him. And in a sense, Christ asked him the same question. In a sense, what did he say? He said, Father, remember me when thou comest in your kingdom. What is your, your, your request this morning? Ask Jesus this moment. And if you believe like blind, <coughs> sorry, like blind Bartimaeus, if you believe like him, then it will be done to you. Amen? Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for this word. And we pray that you will help us to understand that following you, though we may lose everything earthly, we will gain an eternal life. May we trust you. May we believe in you. And as we ask our request this morning, whatever it is, dear Father, please grant it unto us according to riches and glory, we pray in Jesus' name.